princess was born to a king and queen. They were so happy they decided to hold a great banquet to celebrate the event. Invitations were prepared, and a special one with a big red ribbon tied in a bow was sent to the seven fairies of the forest. For they were to be godmothers to the princess and bring her good luck. For days, the cooks and bakers worked like bees, making delicate roasts and fluffy pastries to please the dainty appetites of fairies. For the king and queen didn't want to offend the little people in the slightest. On the day of the great feast, the seven fairies arrived, sailing through the air in a brilliant blue chariot drawn by a hundred swallows. The fairies were delighted to be such honored guests. But then, at the height of the festivities, there was a great flapping of wings, a strange wild call, and through the banquet hall window flew an old gray gander, ridden by an old wrinkled fairy dressed all in black. The king and queen were alarmed. They suddenly realized that there was an eighth fairy, the fairy from across the mountains, whom they had not invited. And now she had come anyhow, without an invitation. The king and queen apologized and made her welcome. But the eighth fairy refused even to smile and stalked into a corner with a scowl fierce enough to make it thunder and rain. At last the time came for the fairies to give gifts to the little princess. The first fairy waved her wand and said, she shall be good as gold. She shall be the cleverest princess in the world, said the second. And the most beautiful, said the third. The happiest, said the fourth. With the sweetest voice ever heard, said the fifth. And everyone shall love her, said the sixth. Everyone waited for the seventh fairy to speak. But she had disappeared. At that moment, the eighth fairy stepped forward, waving her black wand and said, The princess shall stick her finger on the needle of a spinning wheel and die. Suddenly, out from behind a curtain stepped the seventh fairy. She had been hiding until she discovered what trouble the eighth fairy meant to bring. Now, she couldn't do away entirely with the eighth fairy's spell, but she could soften the blow. The princess shall not die of the wound, cried the seventh fairy. She shall only sleep for a hundred years until a prince comes to awaken her with a kiss. that the wicked fairy spell was partly broken. But they left the palace wondering if the little princess would prick her finger on a spinning wheel and become a real sleeping beauty. The king and queen decided to do everything in their power to protect their princess from the wicked fairy's charm. Soldiers were sent near and far to gather together every spinning wheel in their kingdom. They were burned or broken into little pieces, so that in all the land there was not a single spinning wheel left. The years went by, and as the six good fairies had prophesied, the princess grew up to be extremely beautiful, clever, with a nightingale's voice, loved by all who knew her. One day, the young princess decided to explore the castle, which was very large, and had rooms and hallways she had never seen. Soon she came to a winding staircase which led to an old tower. Up the stairs she went, opened a door, and stopped in amazement. There, in a little room in the tower, sat an old woman bent over a wheel, spinning. Now, the princess had never seen a spinning wheel, and she was entranced. The old woman beckoned to her. Come, I'll teach you how to spin. As the princess touched the spinning wheel, she pricked her finger, and at that very instant fell to the floor into a deep sleep. 
The old woman, who was the eighth fairy in disguise, laughed and disappeared. Immediately, everyone else in the kingdom fell asleep. The guards at their posts, the cook at his stove, the king and queen on their thrones. The castle grew silent, as if night had settled over it. Years passed. Until at last, in the hundredth year, a young prince from a neighboring kingdom, hunting in the forest, spied the towers of the forgotten castle. Curious, he rode forward. Inside the lost castle, the prince was surprised to find everyone asleep. At last, he reached the little room in the tower, and there, before the spinning wheel, he found Sleeping Beauty. The prince was so overwhelmed by her beauty that he couldn't resist stooping to kiss her on the cheek. At that instant, Sleeping Beauty awoke, and so did the guards at their post, the cook at his stove, the king and queen on their thrones. The castle was alive again. Not long after that, the prince married Sleeping Beauty, and everyone was invited. And of all the guests, the princess was most happy to see the one who had saved her life more than 100 years before, the seventh fairy. A long time ago, in the middle of the forest, lived two children. The boy was named Hansel. Oh, I'm Hansel. And the girl was named Gretel. I'm Gretel. Their mother and father were very poor. But Hansel and Gretel were cheerful nonetheless. Sometimes Gretel would be so full of happiness that she'd want to dance with joy. Then she always said to her brother, Hansel, come and dance with me. Now, Hansel was a little bashful, and he would usually say, I'd love to dance, Gretel, but I don't know how. Oh, it's easy. With your foot, you tap, tap, tap. With your hand, you coo, tap, tap. Right the third, left the third, about and back again. That dancing made me hungry, Gretel. When will Mother and Father come home with food? Well, not till late. But I know what. Let's pick strawberries in the forest. What if we lose our way? We can drop crumbs of bread as we walk. That'll leave a trail for us to follow back home. A wonderful idea, Gretel. Let's go. Off they went into the forest, dropping bread crumbs as they ran. Each carried a little basket, and just as they stooped to gather strawberries, Hansel said, Gretel, look. See that little man over there? Why, his hair is gold, and his cheeks are red. I wonder who is he? Now he's gone, Hansel. Maybe we just imagined him, Gretel. Come, let's gather strawberries. Soon, Hansel and Gretel filled their baskets. It was time to rush home, but when they looked for the trail of breadcrumbs... Hansel is gone. That little bluebird up there, he's eaten all the breadcrumbs. We'll never find our way home now. Oh, Gretel, what do we do? Poor Hansel and Gretel. Night was coming to the forest. Suddenly, standing near them again, was a little man in velvet brown. Who are you? I'm your friend, the Sandman. It's time to go to sleep. First, I sprinkle you with sand. Then you sink down into the grass. And before you close your eyes, say your prayers. So angels watch over you. 
And at that moment, Hansel and Gretel fell fast asleep. But what a surprise awaited them when they awoke in the morning. Do you know the surprise? When Hansel and Gretel awakened the next morning, they leapt to their feet in amazement. For there, in the middle of the forest, stood the most unusual cottage they had ever seen. Hansel, in my whole life, I've never seen a cottage like that one. What is the roof made of? And the windows? And that hedge that runs around the cottage? Good things to eat. Or am I dreaming still? Oh, Gretel, I'm so hungry. Let's nibble a bit of the cottage. Let's start with the gingerbread. Then we'll go to the chocolate cream. Then hurry, sister, hurry. But just as they took their first bite, a voice shouted, Stop! Stop! How dare you eat my house? It was the Wicked Witch. And this wonderful house was hers. Hansel and Gretel wanted to run away, but the witch stared at them and stared at them and shouted, Hocus Pocus, Bonus Jocus, Malus Locus, Hocus Pocus. And neither Hansel nor Gretel could move from the spot. You there, Hansel. I think I'll lock you in a cage and fatten you up. And when you're good and fat, you'll make a delicious pie. Poor Hansel. Ever so often, the witch said, Hansel, stick your finger out so that I can tell how fat you're getting. But the witch couldn't see very well. And Hansel stuck out a piece of wood and said, Oh, you're still very bony. Later, I'll feed you again. When the witch was out of sight, Gretel said, Hansel, I have a way to fool the witch. I'll tell her you're fat enough to be baked into a pie right now. Gretel! Trust me, Hansel. I'll save you. When the witch came back, Gretel lit the oven and told the witch to take Hansel out of his cage. <laughs> You'll make a fine pie, Hansel. Wait a minute. What's the matter, Gretel? Something's wrong with the oven. Will you take a look inside, please? Mmm, very well. The wicked witch looked into the oven, and then... Quick, Hansel, help me push her in. With one push, the witch landed in the oven, went up in smoke, and disappeared forever. With that, the gingerbread head and the roof of Turkish delight and the windows made of sugar all turned into little boys and girls because that's what they'd been in the first place. Then the bluebird who had eaten the breadcrumbs appeared in the sky and led them all back to Hansel and Gretel's parents. Each child carried food and precious things from the witch's house so the family was never poor again. And even today, you can see Gretel teaching Hansel her happy little dance. With your foot you tap, tap, tap. With your hand you clap, clap, clap. Right foot first, left foot there. Round the boat and back again. of the Red Shoes. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Karen who lived in a small village with her mother. They were so poor that Karen didn't even own a pair of shoes, and she had to go around barefoot until the village shoemaker made her a pair of sandals out of some leftover strips of red cloth. One day, Karen's mother became very ill and died, leaving her little daughter all alone in the world. But on a bright morning soon after that, one of the town's rich old ladies rode by Karen's house in her handsome carriage and saw the unhappy little girl sitting on the doorstep, crying bitterly. The old lady stopped and spoke to Karen. 
And when she heard what had happened to the poor child, she offered to look after her. So the kind old lady brought Karen to her home, dressed her in good clothes, and sent her to school. Of course, Karen was thankful for such good fortune, but one thing made her unhappy. The old lady didn't like red shoes. She had long since thrown away the red cloth sandals the village shoemaker had sewn. Some time later, the princess was taking a journey through the country. When she passed through the village where Karen lived, the people crowded around her. Karen especially noticed the red leather shoes the princess was wearing. These are just about the most beautiful red shoes I've ever seen, thought Karen. Oh, if only I could have such shoes to wear to church on Sunday. Now Karen longed so much for red shoes that when the old lady, whose eyesight was very bad, took her to buy new shoes, Karen chose a shining pair of red ones very much like the princesses and told the old lady they were black. Next Sunday in church, Karen thought of nothing but the lovely red shoes on her tiny feet. While everyone sang hymns, she seemed to see the dainty slippers floating before her eyes. One day, Karen was invited to a grand ball in the town. She knew very well it was unwise to go to the ball, since the old lady, who had been so kind, was very ill and needed the little girl to help nurse her back to health. But Karen couldn't resist the chance to wear her beautiful red shoes. So she went to the ball, and when she began to dance, everyone said, What pretty dancing shoes! Then a strange thing happened. Karen couldn't stop dancing. As if the shoes had suddenly taken on some magical power, they danced her down the stairs, through the streets, and out of the town gate. Away she danced, and away she had to dance, into the forest. Little Karen was terribly frightened and tried to throw off the red shoes, but they stuck fast to her feet. Over the fields and meadows, all through the night she danced, until she came into a churchyard. There stood an angel with long white robes. You shall dance in your red shoes till you are pale and cold. But Karen couldn't stand still long enough to hear the rest of the angel's words. For away the poor little girl danced over the roadways, back into the woods. There she spied a small hut among the huge trees. Luckily, her magic red shoes danced her up to the door. She knocked on it. A tall, smiling woodsman opened it. And Karen, unable to move anymore, fell on the ground. The woodsman carried her inside and put her on a cot. Karen looked down at her feet, which had swelled to five times their size and seemed to be getting bigger and bigger. But as she told her sad story to the woodsman, the red shoes, which no longer fitted her, began to split. And pretty soon, they fell right off. After Karen rested a while, the woodsman put her in his cart and took her back to the old lady's house. The old lady had completely recovered. Karen asked her forgiveness for telling an untruth and leaving her all because of a pair of red shoes. The old lady forgave the little girl, and next Sunday they went to church together. And as Karen joyfully sang the hymns with the rest of the townspeople, she seemed to see the white-robed angel smiling at her knowing Karen had learned that kindness and love are far more precious possessions than a pair of red shoes.
Mother's Day in Persia was the most celebrated day of the year. Wonderful shows were prepared to entertain the king and the prince. At the end of the program, a lone figure stood before the king with a beautiful horse. Your Majesty, I beg thee, look upon this wondrous animal. It is not real, but an ingenious machine that will carry me anywhere I wish, just by turning a peg. Well, if true, it is indeed a wonderful animal. What is the price? It is not for sale, sire, but I would exchange it for a portion of your kingdom. Well, for such a trade, I must know more about this horse. My son, Prince Brahma, will test the animal for me. The owner started to show the prince how to control the horse. But before he could tell him all, Prince Prama turned the peg and away he flew. He doesn't know how to bring it back. It's a trick to kidnap the prince. Throw this man in jail until my son returns. As the horse's owner was taken away, the king scanned the skies for the flying prince. But he was out of sight. High above the clouds flew the enchanted horse with the frightened prince. He traveled hundreds of miles, but he couldn't control the animal. He twisted the peg, but the horse continued to fly upward and onward. At last, he found a small knob behind the animal's ear. He gave it a turn, and the enchanted horse started to descend. As he came closer to Earth, the prince saw he was in a strange kingdom. I will be in danger if I am found, but I can't control the horse. The amazing animal carried Prince Prama toward a palace courtyard. After I land, I'll turn the peg. Maybe it will fly away again, perhaps right back to my own country. So intent was the prince on the controls that he didn't watch the archway through which the horse flew. He was knocked off the horse into a courtyard. No one saw him, and while everyone crowded about the mysterious horse, Prince Prama hid in a room. After studying the horse, the king gave out an order. This is a most unusual animal. I shall give it as a gift to Princess Serena. Yeah, perhaps then she'll be my bride. Take the animal to the stable until I'm ready to give it to her. Prince Prama could hear the king's orders, and now he realized his chance of escaping was gone. Then he heard someone sobbing. He discovered that he was in the room of Princess Serena. She was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She looked up and saw the prince staring at her. Who are you? I'm Prince Prama. I come from far away. Don't let them know I'm here. Oh, did my father send you to rescue me from King Agnir? No, but perhaps I can help. Tell me how you came to this place. Princess Serena then told Prince Prama the story of how she was captured by the powerful King Agmir. She must marry him or be put to death. I have an idea. If you pretend to be ill, the king will have to postpone any decision until you're well. I'll hide out in the city and return when the time is right. The princess agreed, and she acted as if she were in a trance. And soon the whole palace was alarmed. Word got to the king about her illness. Send for the best doctors in the kingdom. Each doctor who came tried to cure the young girl, and each failed. King Agmir sent out a call to physicians from other lands. One day, a strange doctor came to the palace. I can cure the princess, but I must attend her alone. When the doctor was alone in the sick girl's room, he spoke to her. Princess Serena, arise, for it is time for us to leave. Prince Prama, it is you? Yes, Serena, but we must play the game for a while yet. Now we will see the king. Sire, you see she is almost cured already. Now, some special, unusual gift from you may complete the treatment. How fortunate. I have been saving a most unique horse to give to the princess. So the enchanted horse was brought to the palace. It's beautiful. May I sit in the saddle? Of course, my dear. It's yours. Prince Prama helped Princess Serena up on the horse. Then he turned to the king. You see, sire, she is cured. Now for my fee. Of course, good doctor. What is your wish? I wish the princess myself. He jumped behind Serena. Never. She is mine. Guards, seize him. But the guards gaped in wonder as the horse rose from the floor and soared away. Out over the fields and mountains, the prince and princess flew. 
After many hours, Prince Parma looked below and saw the palace of his father. The enchanted horse had brought them home. The king was delighted to see his lost son and welcomed the princess. Prince Parma told his father that Serena had consented to be his bride. The happy king released the owner of the horse and granted him a part of the kingdom in exchange for the animal. Later, when Prince Prama and Princess Serena were married, the king gave them the mechanical animal as a wedding gift. The young people rode away to have many more wonderful adventures with the enchanted horse. Once far across the ocean in sunny Spain, there was a little baby bull named El Torito and seven little Spanish boys who hoped someday to become famous bullfighters or toreadors, as they're called in Spain. Fighting is a very popular sport in Spain, just as baseball is in our country. And little Spanish boys dream about becoming famous toreadors. Toreadors are men who stand in the bull arena with sword and cape and use their skill to evade the horns of the angry bulls. To become good at anything, it takes a lot of practice. And in every city, town, and village in Spain, one can always see little boys practicing to become toreadors. In one little village, there lived the seven little boys who were practicing bullfighting all of the time. They were Jose, Carlos, Juan, Esteban, Pancho, Manuel, and Pedro. They used sticks for swords, and they would wave potato sacks for capes. All day long, they would parade through the village, waving their sticks and swirling their capes in the manner of the real Toreadors in the big city of Madrid. In their own mind, they were the greatest of Toreadors in all Spain. Outside the village, fenced in a large field, there lived a little baby bull. His name was... El Torito. El Torito was a very young bull, and he had no horns on his head, just little bumps where the horns would be someday later on. El Torito was a happy little fellow, as most animals are when unmolested. And he enjoyed prancing around and sometimes scratching his head on the bark of the cork trees that grew in his field. Sometimes, though, El Torito wished there was someone around to play with. It was a little lonesome being all by himself. Back in the village, the boys got tired of just playing at being Toreadors. They decided that the time had come to be real Toreadors and fight a real bull. Not a big bull, of course, just a little one without horns, one like El Torito. So they started up the road toward the field where El Torito was, waving their sticks and swirling their capes. Seven brave little Toreadors. Jose, Carlos, Juan, 
Esteban, Pancho, Manuel, and Pedro. Standing in his field, El Torito saw the boys approaching. And little El Torito was happy. Here, at last, were some visitors. Little boys who would talk to him and perhaps play with him. He watched them climb the fence into his field, and sure enough, the boys wanted to play. El Torito started to run, and the boys ran after him, shouting, waving their potato sacks, and swinging their sticks. El Torito enjoyed the fun, but suddenly, the sticks began to hit him, and with each hit, El Torito became a little more mad until he finally was very mad indeed, and nobody can get quite as mad as a mad little bull. El Torito was all through playing and charged at the boys, and the little Toreadors ran as fast as their little legs would carry them, but not as fast as El Torito, for he caught up with them and bumped each one of the seven over the fence. Jose! Carlos! Juan! Esteban! Pancho! Manuel! And Pedro! <laughs>
improve on nature. Something terrible happened to him. He was a nice old man, but he had an idea he could make all ugly things beautiful. mistakes that many people kick at. She made more drab and ugly things than you can shake a stick at. So that is why I'm working here. I feel it is my duty to find the formula for changing ugliness to beauty. Aha! I've got it! I'll do away with ugliness. I'll start this very minute. I'll beautify this world of art. And everything that's in it. In that book of mine is better left unknown. And after this, my motto is 
Leave well enough for long.
Hello. Hello. Just a minute, please. Hey, Captain. The widow Perkins wants to talk to you. Good <laughs> gosh. Hello, Mrs. Perkins. How are you? It's kind of down around here, Captain. Can you come up and play some tunes for the old folks? I'd be delighted, Mrs. Perkins. We'll be right over. <laughs> You gotta like a don't you, cat? <laughs> Tonight, eh, Grandpa?
now. Sweet. Little Audrey, is you reading by that moonlight again? Land six, child, I was warned and rewarned you a million times. That moonlight makes you have bad dreams. Oh, I don't believe it. You is the most disbelieving, child. I was gonna tuck you in and you go to sleep right this here minute. Got lost. 
Well, that's mighty fine. And as a reward, Junior, you may show your dream girl how dreams are made. But remember, keep away from the black door. Look, a little Audrey, here's a cat nap. <laughs> Sleeps like a top. And look at here, Audrey.
one of those humans now. A human? Yay! We finally got one! I'm the carp on this beat, miss. You're under arrest. The Supreme Court is now in session, and the trial is about to begin. The plaintiff is the fish, the defendant is the human. Officer Finn, bring the jury in. With a sardine jury, all tried and true, an oily verdict we promise you. The first witness from Fish Land, Willie Weakfish, takes the stand. While swimming on my way to school, down where the ocean is sandy, I nearly swallowed this fish hook, which I thought was peppermint candy. Aw, oh, that's a fish story! Order in the court! Order in the court! Let there be no interfering! Mr. Sailfish, take the stand! Let's continue with this hearing! I was saving nonchalantly, never dreaming of attack, when before you could say, oh, hula -han, I was mounted on a black. I didn't do it! I didn't! Oh! Quiet, quiet, let order prevail. Call in the next witness to unveil his tale. It was a cool December day, and I was below the ocean swirl when I was netted by a whaling tug and drained of my winter oil. Judge, that's a whale of a tail. Order in the court. Now let's examine the testimony of the widow salmon. My children and I were once happy, and life altogether was grand. But now I'm a poor, lonely widow. You see, Judge, my husband was canned. <laughs> there you are, sardines of the jury. The evidence is crystal clear. Make haste in reaching your verdict. It's late, and my supper time's near. We find the human guilty! The Fishland trial is over. It was just and fair. And now, here is your sentence. A seat in the electric chair. The human has escaped. Oh, we're all a lot we say, say for me. 
why these sweet things should not wed. Speak now. Stop. Mother Goose rhymes. Johnny, you recite the first stanza. Oh, Mother Goose, when she wanted to wander, would ride through the air on a very fine gander. Oh, Mother Goose and her nursery rhymes. What does she know about modern times? <gasps> this is more like it. To get at this boodle, I had to use the noodle. I'm a shoppy. That's why my name's Pinhead. This is why I'm white brain. This is gonna be sensational. The voice crooks at Fort Knox. Caught in the act, crime doesn't pay. You ain't got nothing on us. We're a couple of coin collectors. Ain't talking, see? Audrey, recite the next line. I ain't talking. I ain't no stool pigeon, see? <laughs> Audrey, go sit in the corner and memorize Mother Goose. Oh, <laughs> this icky stuff. <sighs> oh, Mother Goose, and all that. And there's Mother Gooseland. You're in for a surprise. We sing, we jive, we're quite alive. What you see will open your eyes. Little boy blue, come blow your horn. The sheep's in the meadow, the cow's in the corn. Where's the little boy that tends the sheep? Well, dig me, Jackson, he's fast asleep. When he lets out steam, then he blows his tongue. When he blows that horn, he can sure be buff. One oddity, boing, 
Boeing Street Prop when he lifts off steam, then he blows his top when he blows that horn, he can sure be the boy. <gasps> That's a dilly. <laughs> Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, his hair was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went, everywhere that Mary went, she fleeced it for his dough. <laughs> Look, there's little Tommy Tucker who sings for his supper. Let's get lost. Lost in each other's arms. Let's get lost. Let them send out alarms. It's folks, it's parameters. Yeah, it's slick. The goose what lays the golden eggs. What a chick. <laughs> Show by brain. It's a golden opportunity. Yeah. Let's. Up with the dukes. This is a stick up. It's those phony, funny crooks. <gasps> oh dear. They don't belong in here. I'm hard boiled. Ah. Nothing can make me crack up. Stop, Dave! Now, 
Now you sit right down and eat your lunch. And no more candy. I just can't understand a child eating candy 48 hours a day. The look on 
your face is telling the news. You've got the tummy ache blues from eating all the candy you did. Honey, child, you is alive. Here's all the candy you want.
didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it to the little birdies. I'm so sorry. Once a year when Christmas comes, I pack my sled with stars and drums, and I'm on my way with happiness for little girls and boys. Oh, there isn't any place too far. I go wherever children are always on my way with happiness, wrapped up in fancy toys. Christmas list, I've many names and places. So we've never seen their faces. We know each one and a good take on. <laughs> 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 And bail again this year. I brought glad tidings and a good cheer. So until another Christmas day, when I pay another call, I'll say Merry Christmas.
I feel sorry for Santa. Yeah, man. He sure tried and won. Ah, yeah. Sweet Harris looks so like you, huh, Kiola? Him claws, blally, blally, bloody, and John. Da, da. See, see, he helped everyone at Christmas, but no one they think of Santa Claus. Well, we could do something for Santa if we only just tidied his house. Santa! <laughs>
we'll meet heroes, giants bold. Is it lands both hot and cold? Have magic tricks to shiver your skin. That's galore with animals in our world of fun. Hi, Piper, hi. Have you ever dreamed of finding a great treasure? Well, I have a story about someone who did. A poor woodcutter named Ali Baba. One day, Ali Baba was cutting wood in the forest when suddenly he got the fright of his life. Oh! Open sesame! Shut sesame! He was so frightened, he didn't dare come down until the fierce-looking men had left their hideout. Then... Open Sesame! This can't all be theirs. They must be thieves. Poor Ali Baba couldn't resist taking some of the gold. And when he showed it to his wife... I'll go and borrow a measure from your brother's wife so we'll know how much we have. Ali Baba's brother, Kasim, was very rich, but he was also very greedy and never gave anything to Ali Baba and his family. They're as poor as we are rich. What have they got that needs measuring? Hmm, we'll soon find out. All unsuspecting, Ali and his wife measured their newfound wealth. But when they returned the scale... Aha! Look at this. Your brother, Ali Baba, borrowed our measure to count gold. Solid gold! I must find out where they got it. The next day, Kasim followed Ali Baba to the magic cave. Open sesame! Shut sesame! <laughs> this is too easy. Open sesame! Shut sesame! richer than I ever dreamed I'd be. Rich, rich, rich! Open, or, uh, open, open, uh, open! What was that word? Open sesame! No, no, no! Oh, Ali! I told Kasim your secret, and now he has disappeared. Help me. Immediately, Ali Baba went to the cave and found his brother's body. It was not a moment too soon. So the cave is open. Someone else knows our secret, but who? It wasn't difficult for the leader of the thieves to find out who it was that knew their secret. The talk about Ali Kasim and his brother Ali Baba was everywhere. The thieves made a plan of attack. We can't all ride up to Ali Baba's house without arousing suspicion. So I will disguise myself as an oil merchant. And the 39 of you will hide inside the oil jars. The 40th jar will be filled with real oil so that I can fool Ali Baba into thinking I'm an honest merchant. <laughs> The best that money can buy. I'll take all 40 jars, and you must dine with us. I'll go and tell my wife that we have a bountiful guest. I'll join you in a moment. As soon as I give the signal, rush out and attack them. No more oil. I'll get some from the new jar. Is it time? Is it time? So that's their game. The brave woman then proceeded to do the deed which saved the lives of all of her family. <laughs> now my wife wishes to dance for you. And since she dances very well, I will allow it. A uh, most charming hostess. He would have killed us. If that's supposed to be a signal for your men, it will do you no good. My men, where are they? Gone, into the night. When the leader of the thieves realized he was alone and trapped, he became frightened. 
please spare my life, and I promise you'll never see me again. They let the villain go, and he disappeared and was never seen by anyone again. So don't forget, if like Kasim you ever get trapped in a magic cave, remember the words that open the door and say, Open! Open, uh... Oh, what was that word? Come and see all the wonders there will be In my stories, in my songs, in everything where fun belongs We'll meet heroes, giants bold, visit lands both hot and cold Have magic tricks to shiver your skin That's galore with animals in our world of fun Pied Piper Hunt! You know... Sometimes good fortune comes to us in the most unexpected way, and just when things look blackest. Our tale today is about a poor young man named Peter who set off to seek his fortune carrying all his worldly goods on his back. But he was so simple and trusting that before long he got cheated out of everything he owned. I'm an old woman and an honest man. I'm going to buy something. Indeed, I would, old one, but I have no money. Then I'll trade you something for what you've got on your back. This valuable old horn, for instance. Is it really valuable? Indeed it is. For you could make your fortune by playing it for money. Say, that's right. Good enough, old one. You've made a bargain. I have indeed. For the horn is worthless. It won't even play. But the horn was not as worthless as the old woman imagined. It was a magic horn. And although it would not play, it could never be lost or stolen, for it always returned to its rightful owner. And it had another magic quality, which Peter was soon to discover. Now, friends, I'm going to play a concert for you. And you may pay me as much as it pleases you. Ready? Where did everyone go? Unfortunately, it was the same wherever he went. At the first... <laughs> on the magic horn, everyone disappeared. And poor Peter didn't earn a single penny. He got hungrier and hungrier until finally he learned that the king was looking for a shepherd to herd the royal sheep. Well, I might as well try that. At least I ought to be able to use this old thing to call sheep. Mind you do a good job. All the shepherds I've had so far have lost a lot of my prized sheep. I'll do my best, sire. And so he began his new life as a shepherd. Uh-oh, the sheep are wandering. I'll bring them back with my horn. But as usual, the opposite happened. This is too much. Can't I do anything right? I treated everything I had for this, and all it's brought me is trouble. I ought to throw it away. I wonder... No, that's ridiculous. Still, maybe. At last, Peter had discovered the real secret of the magic horn. My goodness! Won't the king be surprised? And indeed, the king was. Look at that! Isn't he clever? I wonder how he managed it. He must have done it with that old horn of his. He doesn't have anything else. We've got to get that horn away from him and find out for ourselves. But it wasn't as easy as it sounded. There you are. There was nothing to it. Nothing to it is right. Yes, Father dear. The bag is empty. What? That young man has a few things to explain. And thinking that he was to be given a reward for his good work, Peter came happily into the throne room. We want to know how that horn works. Well, it's like this. Never mind the explanations. Show us. You want me to show you right here, Your Majesty? Of course he does. He's the king, and that's his command. Very well, then. And suddenly, the entire royal family found themselves taking some unusual exercise. Where did you get that horn? 
What did it cost you? It cost me all my worldly goods. And I'm beginning to think it was worth it. Well, it's a clever toy. I'll give you 50 horses. No. 20 casks of treasure? No. A position as my prime minister? No. I don't want any of those things, Your Majesty. I only want the princess. No, never. It simply won't do. Now, listen here. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, terrible news. We're being invaded. The enemy are coming through the hills. They'll be here any minute. What? Call up the army. We can't, sire. The army has run away. Well, call up the... Uh, call up... Call up Peter, father. Yes. I will fight them, sire. My boy, you can have the princess, the horses, the treasure, in any position you ask. Yes, anything. Only save us. Thank you. But your lovely daughter is all I ask. And so Peter went out and faced the enemy single-handed. And so the old woman's nasty bargain brought Peter happiness and good fortune. And everything turned out for the best after all. Say, I wonder where that magic horn is now.